that's dangerous. I've just been told I've got more time. So I'm not going to tell you who I am because, frankly, it doesn't matter. I find it interesting, though, that, you know, sometimes we use the concept or you hear the phrase of preaching to the choir. And in this context, it seems even more interesting. And sometimes I like to find out what does that phrase mean? Where did that come from, preaching to the choir? Anybody, anybody have any ideas about that? So one of the things my girlfriend told me, he said, whatever you do, don't talk about religion today. Well, I'm going to talk about religion today. So the whole idea of preaching to the choir is that the choir, and I'm a recovering Catholic, the choir hears the same preaching the same homilies, whatever you call it in, in your denomination, time after time after time. And in fact, little known fact about me, I actually graduated from a seminary. So I, I kind of relate to that. You hear these things over and over again. And you are the choir because every person that comes up here and talks about what we're here for, DevOps, you've heard all this stuff before, all of it. But what you're hoping for, what will be good about this, is if you hear something that you've heard before, but you hear it a little differently, and maybe you hear about it in a way that strikes you a little differently, and you walk away with a different message about the same thing. And that's a lot of what we want to do here. Now, the choir thing doesn't always translate, though, into every religion. Some just don't work that way. So maybe we can switch that paradigm just a little bit and say that we're all pilgrims because all of the religions have a pilgrim in them. I don't mean the folks that came across on the Mayflower, but it means that we have this common journey, that we're headed in the same direction. We may not be going to exactly the same place, but we're going to have many common experiences. And in those common experiences, by sharing them with each other, sometimes we can help lighten the load for someone else. Sometimes we can help them see the problem that they're fighting is not really the problem that they have. And so that's what I want us to talk about, to look at today a little differently. DevOps is incredibly important. Our companies will live or die based on how well we do that. But it's only one part of the overall problem that our companies, that our culture, that our country have today. We need to do things a lot differently. And certainly code to cloud is a part of that. And it's a great place to start because we can latch onto that. But there's some bigger pieces to that. Now one of the things that you won't see from me in, in here is a Twitter handle. I have Twitter, honestly I don't like it because I can't say anything in 140 characters, not even with 280. But what you will see is the ability to engage with me on LinkedIn, because then we can have a more robust conversation. If you care about what do I know, what's my experience, you can look at it and evaluate for yourself. So I would welcome every one of you to connect with me on LinkedIn. And when we're done with this, next week, next month, whatever, if you would like to reach out to me to talk about something, I'm happy to do that. I want to spend at least a couple hours each week talking to folks that I may have never met before, talking with folks that are on this journey, that we can share this pilgrimage. We can talk about our differences in the same experience and move on from there. But digital transformation is really what we need to focus on. As technologists, and most of us are, there's a whole lot of technology to it, but the technology is the easy part. And it's why we start there, and it's what keeps the flywheel going for a lot of us. And we hear the term digital transformation. In fact, if you like to read any of the Gartner's, Forrester's, et cetera, Forrester has a 2018 report out, and it says, uh, according to the CIOs and CEOs that they talk to, that over 60% of the CEOs say they are behind on their digital transformation. 20% say they haven't even started their digital transformation. Is that a problem? 
You bet it is. It sure is. And part of that problem is worse than what is actually being reported. Because if you talk to those CIOs and CEOs and you ask them, what's digital transformation? You're going to get a different answer from every one of them. And they're probably all going to be wrong. They may be directionally correct, but we are the problem. And by we, I mean the technologists, I mean the technology managers, I mean the software vendors, I mean the consulting organizations. Why is that? What is that problem? Well, we've sold them a bill of goods. I had lunch with a CEO a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about this, and the subject of automated testing came up. And he says, oh, Jack, I am so frustrated with my automated testing. We are not getting the return on investment that we were promised. I'm like, oh, hang on. Don't say another word. Let me guess. You thought that you were going to implement this solution, and in return, you're going to lay off half your testers, right? Yeah, exactly. We haven't been able to get rid of anybody. That was never really the answer. But it was an expedient way to get some money out of that organization. The reality is we need more testers today than we have. Tomorrow, we're going to need even more. And the day after that, we're going to need even more. Why is that? Well, because we need to test more. And we need to test in an automated way. It's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Anybody ever see that movie? Charlie's dad lost his job putting the caps on. They didn't need him to do that anymore. They had a machine that did it. But they then realized they had to have somebody that kept the machine running. We're going to need to do that with our organizations. Digital transformation is going to move a lot of stuff around in our company, and we're going to look at that a little bit. But what we really need to focus on is that DevOps is one piece of that. Agile, one piece of that. Lean is one piece of that. And along the, the way, over the past few years, we continue to put our hand out to the senior leaders and say, I need money, I need resources, because I'm going to do this agile transformation. I'm going to do this lean transformation. And we don't connect those dots. And they've never seen how those dots connect. And so that's where we, as pilgrims, now need to help our senior leaders. They want to do this. They know that it's going to take resources. What they don't know and what they're getting really frustrated with is how this all works together. How does your part make this happen? Now, it would be great if we could just press this pause button, stop everything, reorganize, restructure our culture, put in new technologies, but the reality is that's not going to happen. You're not going to get that chance to do that. But there is a whole lot that you can do and you should be doing. Why? Because you can help yourself. When you go back and if you have the opportunity to you know, get some of the, the earlier stuff that Gene Kim and, and John Willis and others did, why did they start this journey? Does anybody know offhand? Because they hated go live weekends. They hated the fact that they had to bust their butt till 10 o'clock at night trying to resolve all of these problems that they didn't know about because if they had been able to do that during the day, then they could spend the evenings with their kids. They could go out and work with their communities. They wanted to make their lives better. They wanted to make their lives better for their teams. That's how this all got started. Now, you are probably in the same place. I know for years, I never got to spend Christmas and New Year's. That was when we were redoing the data center stuff putting in AS 400s forever ago, I know, but it's been a problem and that's the way it is for us. Does anybody look forward to, you know, re release weekend? One day, <laughs> you must be a vendor. <laughs> so really do this for yourself, help yourself. And that's where, you know, where you sit and what you do, again, our pilgrimage. We want others to become part of this with us. As you help yourself, you're going to make things better for other folks, whether it's your family, whether it's your coworkers, whatever that is. So help yourself. So 
one of the core questions has always got to be, what's in it for me? Now, for you, if it's something you want to do, that's good enough. But if we're going to ask other people around us, other people on our team, maybe other teams, other parts of our organization, we've got to answer them that question. We've got to help them find what's in it for me. Now, again, I'm going to assume most of us are technologists here. So most of us got into technology because it was fun. We got to go discover things. We could go try new things. Is it exciting to get a new tool or to start learning a new language? Absolutely. It's wonderful to get out there and look and see, what are my options? What can I do? That's fun. Let's do that. How about having a hand on the rudder that you have something to say about how you work, about what you do, about the way that you do it? This is your opportunity to make it better, to make it more fun. And it is fun, and it's exciting. The first time you write a new piece of code, and it runs, and it does exactly what you thought it was going to do, is there a better high? I've never found it. It is a great way to go. It's a great way to invest your time, your energy. And you can make your life better. Have a hand in that. Make it better for you. Make it better for the people that are downstream from you. We talked about, I saw, I think Jim had the percent complete and accurate. How much do we like getting garbage from upstream? You don't want to be pushing garbage downstream. So the things that we do that make DevOps work help us avoid that, help us do better. Now, the hardest part about this whole thing is deciding I'm going to do something. So I want you to get a little bit uncomfortable with the next few minutes of this discussion because I want you to walk away from here deciding to do something. I don't care where it is. There's plenty to be done. I don't care where you start because you can expand those circles out. I want you to then find some friends. Now think about the friends that you have right now. Maybe they're from work. More often than not, they're because they're from your neighborhood or they're from your school. Now, are those friends from your neighborhood and school, did they come to you because you already knew you liked the same things? You were attracted to the same things? You did the same things? Maybe. Most of the time, it's because you saw them every day. We rode the school bus together. We listened to these awful, awful lectures we went through these crushing group projects. We went through something together. Or you joined a club, and we did this stuff together. So find a friend that's interested in making life better and start working with them. And pretty soon you're gonna find out you're gonna have better relationships. Now, the other thing I want you to do is find some folks that aren't your friends. In fact, Find your nemesis. Somebody who always finds what you're doing is wrong. It's the wrong direction. It's the wrong stuff. You're doing the wrong thing. Find that person, and they'll become your friend by the time you get through this. They'll help you see, and you'll begin to understand why they have been your nemesis. And they will then become your best ally over time because you've included them in this. And you're going to figure this stuff out Together, it's not just you, not just me, not even just the two of us, it's all of us. You need to be inclusive. One of the, some of the most interesting conversations that I heard yesterday were around security and around how do I get other folks on board with this? Well, invite them in. Have them become a part of this process. Have your information security folks be part of how you design your processes. Have internal audits come and help understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. Why are we putting in these tools? I heard yesterday a lady talking about se uh, segregation of duties. That used to be a thing. Going forward, that should not be a thing because we can automate all of this, make it faster, better, cheaper than the way we've been doing it. And yet, all three used to be faster, better, cheaper, just pick two. Now, it's got to be all three. 
And you don't have to figure it out all at once. Do one little bit today. Do a little bit more tomorrow. Next week, expand your circle. Iterate through this. And to be innovative doesn't mean that you sit up bolt upright in the middle of the night going, ah, I figured it out. No, it's about making a little bit of improvement each and every day. One step each day. Another step the next day. And you keep going. And sometimes you're going to have a step back, and that's okay. You want to keep after it. That's where we really get things going. Now, duh, pick the low-hanging fruit. You know what? Most of the time we miss it. We skip it. We don't do that. I know that my team used to use subversion. Anybody here use subversion? Does anybody like it? No! It's horrible. Horrible. So the first time we looked at GitHub, we're like, oh my God, this is wonderful. This is good stuff. I can tell you, um, some of you may know Carmen Diardo. He and I have written a book. We use GitHub to keep our stuff straight. It's simple, it's easy, it doesn't have to be code. I saw somebody else, uh, one of the earlier presenters, has their materials available on GitHub. It is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Pick the low hanging fruit. What is the most painful thing for you? Address that. What is the thing that would be the most value for you? Address that. Pick off one and keep moving. Now, there was another question that I loved yesterday about value stream mapping. Do we need to do a value stream map? The answer is yes unquestionably, without any reservation, you must do value stream mapping. Your organization has to do it. And you need to get a senior leader to go with you on this because everybody thinks they know how this works. Some people will be honest and say they don't. Senior leaders might think that they do. But when you start going through the process and you actually walk through it, you're going to find out you've got some heroes in your organization. And you've got some zeros in your organization. And the hero culture is what's kept many of them going. Once you do this, I mean, why would you go on a trip today without Google Maps, right? It'd be crazy to do that. And that's exactly what's happening if we're not doing value stream mapping. Just like the theory of constraints that we talked about yesterday. We need to lower the water so that we can see where those rocks are. Using value stream mapping will point out where those rocks are. Where should we focus our time? Don't waste your time optimizing part of it that isn't the problem. Now, we got to talk about tools. This is a technology thing, right? But the most beautiful part about the way our technology industry has developed over the past 10 or 15 years is the rise of open source. Every tool that's on this screen is open source. So you can start doing your work without spending a pile of money. Now, if you go into production, you're gonna to wanna to get some help. So it won't be free forever. But here's the deal. When we look at the three ways of DevOps, the first one is systems thinking and developing flow. Now along the bottom, most of us kind of got that figured out. Now, we may not have implemented all of it, and we have a whole lot to talk about in terms of security testing. But that part's kind of figured out. Is that what Gene's really talking about for systems thinking? How about the shorten and amplify feedback loops? No, because the whole point of value stream mapping is the creation and delivery of value from the customer's perspective. And if Amazon has done nothing else, they have taught us, they have shown us what customers, they have reshaped what customers' expectations are. The days of doing annual releases are long behind us. Quarterly releases, dead, I hope. Even monthly releases don't cut the mustard. You've heard the numbers before. Amazon does, what, 23,000 releases a day? Google is a few thousand, Netflix 500 releases a day. Are we gonna do that? Probably not. But the way they can do that is by totally automating at a minimum the bottom line. And if you really wanna be good, we need to do this full loop. From in the upper right where we have the business idea, the old days it was fine writing on a cocktail napkin. 
take it back to some kind of a meeting that happens on a weekly or monthly basis, get it into the quarterly review to get prioritized, get into the annual funding cycle. We can't do that anymore. We can't do that unless we're making buggy whips. We can't do that anymore. We've got to flow this information all the way around. Amplify the feedback loops. It's not just a stream because it needs to keep on going. Right? So, we can use an open source tool like SamePage. Now, if you've seen any of my other presentations, I have ones with vendor tools as well. So we could plug in SharePoint there. We could plug in a lot of different tools on every one of these. But the point is, if you, from where you're sitting, if you're on the business side, you should be looking at the top side of this. If you interface with the business, you should be looking at the top side of this. How can we get this feedback from the market? How can we get this feedback from the customers? How can we get the feedback on the performance of our applications? We need to feed that back through, and we need to get it into the hands of the business folks, not tomorrow, not next week. We need to get it in their hands today so they can do something with it, so that we can get it into our portfolios. We can get it into the programs and projects. We can then push that into the requirements. And all of these tools that are up here all have API interfaces that can talk to each other. Every one of them. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. I haven't heard a whole lot about talk about chat ops. I think that's the most interesting and exciting thing we've got going today. If you're not using Rocket Chat, check it out. It's not just IRC. It's not just about chatting. It's not about chat rooms. You can make stuff happen. You can make it, you can execute from here. Do notifications. Understand what's happening. Don't get on a, another conference call. Says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm late. Can anybody bring me up to date? How many times has that happened, especially on a go live? Have the persistent chat so everybody can come in and see exactly where we are. The other thing I love about the whole tool space and the way technology is developed, and I particularly love Zebia Labs. I have no relationship with them whatsoever, other than I'm an ardent fan. Because A, they have good tools. B, here is something that as a product manager, I would have never, ever done. They put their tools on here, of course. They put their competitor tools on here. They put the free tools on here. So go check out the Zebia uh, periodic table of DevOps tools. It is fantastic. They just updated this. This one is about three weeks old. They've, uh, they continue to update it. It's all best of breed. It will help you weed out and sort through what tools do I want to use? Now, frankly, you know, I came from recently a place that was a big IBM shop. If you've got those tools, hey, they work. You know, dig into them. Get some help because you're probably not using them right. But it doesn't matter what tools you're using. Point is, use a tool. But the hardest part of all is getting up off that comfortable couch, metaphorically speaking, and doing something. Just get going. Get up, make a decision, start the ball rolling. Now, if you haven't read The Phoenix Project, fix that problem. If your boss hasn't read The Phoenix Project, fix that problem. I love the DevOps handbook. That's not for them, that's kind of for us. But there's still another group out there and I want to help you with them as well. You, some of you may know Carmen Diardo. Uh, he's been coming to this for a long time. This is probably his first miss in a long time. Um, Carmen and I have just finished a book. In fact, we, we gave it to the production process yesterday. Um, this is geared towards helping the C-suite. This is around, what does this stuff mean? What do you mean I have to change my culture? What's, how did that come into play? What happened to that automated testing thing? So check out our book, check out our, our website. It's really intended to get, help them understand how lean, how agile, how DevOps all come together. And oh, by the way, that's what gets the ball rolling, but we need to change every part of our business. We need to change our culture. We need to make people feel safe and if they feel trusted so that we can build these systems and processes that will get us to that next level so we don't have yet another failed transformation process that didn't have the underpinnings to really keep it going. 
If I can help you at any point, in any way, honestly, I want you to call me. Call me, text me, send me an email. Um, at the beginning of this, I've got an email address. LinkedIn is probably the best way, because then you have your choice. Let's make it an asynchronous. I may not be able to get to you immediately, but I want to help you. I want to help you, whether that's having a conversation with your boss, whether that's figuring out the next step. I had a great conversation with a friend of mine this morning about how do we get our managers to support this initiative. I started off as a salesman. I'll always be a salesman in some way. Help, let me help you. What was that from Jerry McGuire? Help me help you. Let me help you. I want to do it. If you have any questions, I think we have a few minutes of time left. Leave them in stunned silence. Perfect. Thank you.